Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Mahendra. I am going to read new Old Testament and New Testament um, passages. If you, any one of you need Bible, you can raise your hand and someone will hand over the hard copy. So I am going to read Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with, the equi with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people, peoples in his truth. And the second reading is from Philippians chapter 1 from verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the, throughout the whole palace God and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ, preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether, for, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your prog progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. 
whatever happens conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of christ then whether i come and see you or only hear about you in my absence i will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed but that you will be saved and that by god for it has been granted to you uh, to you on behalf of christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw i had and now hear that i still have thanks mahendra uh, someone handed me a scarf this morning to wear which was very kind of them it's cold isn't it and i said to them is this my preaching scarf and they said no but i'm going to wear it anyway because it it just feels nice thank you julie um, i'm going to pray for us father as we look into your word um, we pray that you would help us to see what you are doing here in this place and what our priorities should be and we pray it in jesus name amen well we're in a church uh, that has been here for the last 100 years and now we have before us new times new opportunities new vision what's our vision what's our direction where are we going what's what will the next five years look like that's what we're talking about over these next few weeks last week we talked about seeing the vision and we we uh, talked about the fact that we want to be an international church we want to reflect the suburb that we're in we want to be a multi-ethnic church we want to be a church where the nations gather and uh, this week is about doing the vision um, what is it we should be doing here um, where is he where are we well we're in wentworth phil aren't we 2145 um we're in a suburb that is 35 percent hindu there are 11,000 people living in wentworth phil itself there are 20,000 people that our church has responsibility for um, th this th that's in our patch and there's less than five percent here that uh, belong to a bible believing church and friends if Jesus is the only way, then that's a lot of people who are facing an eternity without Christ, isn't it? Now, it's not my job to get up here this morning and, you know, try to muster up some emotion in you for 20,000 people that you've never met. That's not my job. My job under God is to take you to the Bible and to get you to see things how God sees things and to see the vision that God has for where we live. All right, and we're going to see three things this morning from Philippians chapter 1. We're going to see, first of all, that the gospel changes our vision. And then we'll see two implications of that. It changes how we see ourselves and it changes how we see Wentworthville. Okay, the gospel changes our vision. That's, that's the main thing I want us to see this morning. The gospel changes our vision. So here is Paul and he's in a Roman prison. He's awaiting trial. He's in chains. And he makes this extraordinary statement in verse 12. Here's what he says. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I'm in prison, he's saying, but the gospel is advancing. The gospel is moving forward. It's like the gospel has got a life of its own. It's like an army that's marching forward and it's gaining new territory. It's crossing borders. It's taking captives. And it's doing it with the most wonderful, wonderful news that there is. The gospel is advancing. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news that you just have to broadcast. The gospel is good news that you can't keep to yourself it, it, it's a, it's like someone left you a million dollars and it's only only it's way better than that that's what the gospel is and when you read philippians you discover that the gospel is the wonderful news that jesus christ who is equal with god 
He became a human and he always obeyed God fully, but his obedience took him to the cross where he died, but he rose again victorious as the reigning Lord. And if you put your trust in this Jesus and not in your own goodness or your track record, then his perfect life becomes yours. His righteousness becomes yours and you'll be saved from that coming day of destruction. That's the gospel in Philippians, that you'll get to be with Christ forever. And Paul says this gospel is advancing, it's progressing, it's taking captives. That's what Paul cares about. That's his driving ambition. And what he does is he gives three examples of this gospel progressing. The first example that he gives has to do with what is happening in prison. Look at verse 13, where Paul says, It has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, the palace guard was made up of around 9,000 soldiers. 9,000. That's basically 9,000 soldiers who know that Paul is in prison for Christ. Um, he would have been chained to one of these soldiers for hours. Um, they would have taken shifts of being chained to Paul. You know, you, you, you can imagine Paul being there in prison and a, a, a guard comes and chains himself up to him for the first time and Paul has a big smile on his face and if he could, he'd rub his hands together, but he, he's in chains, so he can't. But he, he would have been there thinking, oh, yes, Lord, be with this conversation now. And then the guard says... So, what are you in for? And Paul thinks, you beauty. And he has a little twinkle in his eye, and he says, I'm in here because I've been preaching about a Jewish guy who got executed, and he was raised to life three days later, and he's your only chance of being accepted by God and being saved from the coming judgment. So put your trust in him. That's why I'm in here for. And the guard, you know, they await their sh he waits his shift and he goes off and chains himself and he goes off to his mates and he says, guess what I heard from the prisoner in Block C? You know what he told me? And the news spread. And then another guard gets chained to Paul and he says, so, what are you in here for? And it goes on. You can imagine it happening, can't you? You can see it. And the best evangelist in all of history is chained to these Roman soldiers and one by one the Roman soldiers are being converted. They're coming to Christ. Paul loves that his chains mean that the gospel is advancing. That's the first example. The second and the third examples have to do with what is happening outside of the prison. What's happening outside of the prison? Well, Christians have been encouraged to speak. Look at uh, verse 14 where we read, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Because of Paul's example, Christians have become more courageous. When your fearless leader has been thrown into prison for preaching Christ, what does that do to you? Well, it has an effect upon you, doesn't it? it? It makes you courageous. Well, if he has done that, then I can do it as well. By the way, do you notice how Paul gets excited when ordinary Christians preach Christ? He doesn't see that it's just up to the evangelists. It's everyone who is doing it. And, and uh, when he comes to uh, chapter 2, verse 16, he'll command everyone to hold forth the word of Christ. All Christians are involved in opening their mouth and speaking. Some are more gifted than others, of course, but we all do it. And the third thing that's happening uh, in the gospel, progression of the gospel, is that there are competitors, there are rivals. Look at verse 15, where we read, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, there's competitors, right? Verse 17, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. It's 
See, Paul says there's people who are, you know, preaching the gospel out of competition. They're they're rivals. They're wanting to get one better up on me. But (laughs) even if there's wrong motives, I rejoice. Uh, Of course, motives do matter, don't they? And God will test all of our motives one day. But it's not up to us to judge the motives of people. See what Paul says? What does it matter? Verse 18. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. See, Paul sees every situation through one lens, and one lens only. Is the gospel progressing? Is Christ being preached, and are people coming to him? Is the gospel advancing? You know, before I was a married man, I viewed the world through one lens and one lens only. Every time I was invited to an event, every time I was, you know, seated at a reception table at a wedding, every time I was invited to a party or I met a new bunch of Christians, I had a single motive in mind. What was my motive, do you think? Anyone want to guess? (laughs) that's right would i meet that special someone every time i you know it was it was on my mind it's in the back of my mind it was at the forefront of my mind i was don't get me wrong i was very content being single i was very happy being single but you know i I was always thinking will i will this be the moment when i meet somebody i was single-minded to meet that special christian woman and eventually i did uh But see, that's how Paul is with the gospel. He's single-minded. He's got tunnel vision. He's got a single focus. Every single situation, every single event, every single shipwreck that he goes through, he's thinking, will this advance the gospel? Will this advance the gospel? Will this win people for Jesus? And we have to be like Paul. Every ministry that we run in this church, we need to think, will this advance the gospel? Will this win people for Jesus? You know, one of the worst things we can do as a church over the next five years is to be very, very busy and bear no no fruit. The work that we want to be busy with is the work of bearing gospel fruit, seeing new converts come to Christ. Um, We examine every ministry by this. Is this advancing the gospel? And what this means is that as a church, we need to be a church that's committed to growth. We have to be. If we believe that the gospel advances and we believe that it works, then we need to be a church that is committed to growing. Our vision document, Um, that you have hopefully seen. If you haven't, there's some spare copies down the back of the church near the giving box. But our vision document says this, as we take the gospel around us, we see new Christians joining us. We see, as we grow, we see a church of multiple congregations. To lead God's people well, we see a team of ministry staff to lead and shepherd God's people. Now, I'm not a number counter, But do you realise behind every number is a name and behind every name is a soul that matters to God? And so are we prepared to pray for people to come to Christ? Are we prepared to... How many new converts do you think our church could handle this year? Ten, maybe? What about the next year? Ten more? After that, ten. What, what if we prayed that in five years' time we had 50 new converts, new Christians? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's a whole new congregation, is it not? Um, what if we had, in five years' time, we were able to grow to a point where we had two morning churches and one evening church. Wouldn't that be wonderful to see God grow us in that way? Why, we'd need more growth groups, we'd need more growth group leaders, um, we'd need more kids' church leaders and youth leaders. Friends, when we see that the gospel advances, it changes our vision. It changes things. It changes 
And here's the implication I want to talk about next. It changes how we see ourselves. Paul says in verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ. That's his definition of life. That's what life is about for Paul. I mean, if you, you, you need a definition of life, don't you, to make life work. If you have a proper definition of life, you can face anything. And Paul gives us the definition of life that you need to have. This is what it is. For me to live, and what he means is, this is the thing that makes life worth living. This is the thing that makes life life. This is my true north. This is my center. This is the thing that gets me up out of bed in the morning. If I have this, then I'm really alive. No matter what else is going on, my world can be crashing down. And because I have this, then I've got life. What is it? For me to live is Christ. That's what makes life worth living. It's having Christ. And that's why I want other people to have him as well, because this is what life is about. This is the meaning of life. It's Jesus Christ. Living for Christ means striving for the sake of the gospel. That's what Paul does. Look at uh, what he says down in verse 27. I know, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God striving side by side. It's the language of teamwork. It's the language of working together. It's the language of working as one. Someone said to me this week, I don't use enough footy illustrations. Can you imagine, isn't it great seeing the Parramatta Eels when they work as one? (laughs) Or whatever your favorite sporting team is when they're striving and they're working together and all the players come together as, you know, like a concert and they win. And it's so great to see the team operate as one. And friends, that's the church. And this is not a game, by the way. We're talking about working together with the purpose of seeing people come to faith in Christ. It's working together to see people growing and to see people increasing and see the gospel spreading. That's the important thing. And can you see that involves unity? It involves us being united and working together. And it's realizing that we're better together than we are apart. As we strive together for the gospel to spread, we become the force of an army, which is much better than just a solo person in hand-to-hand combat, isn't it? That's the church, uh, working together as one, spreading the gospel. Can you see that spreading the gospel is not just for the people who are in paid ministry? You know, those weird people who get paid for doing it. It's not just for those people. It's not just for the people who are gifted in evangelism. No, disciple making is my job and it's your job as well. It's our job. Disciples are people who make disciples. And what that means is that we will work at getting better at it. We will train ourselves in this task of of making disciples. We'll talk more about this next week. But it means that we'll try new things like putting on an event called India Christian Day which is short notice, I know, but it's, it's an opportunity for us to meet people from our community, isn't it? And to learn about the culture that we're in. It, it's, it's a risk, isn't it? We don't know how it's going to go at short notice, but it means that if we actually are committed to the gospel advancing, that we will take risks and we'll examine things and we'll think, is this resulting in the advance of the gospel? We won't be afraid of failure. And yes... It involves suffering. Verse 29. For it has been granted on you, to you, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still had. Paul says, 
I've been going through a struggle. You know, I, I've, because I've been preaching Christ, I got my head kicked in. And he says to the Philippians, and you're going through the same struggle as well because you're preaching Christ, you got your head kicked in. And if we are going to be a church that preaches Christ, then we'll get our head kicked in as well. It involves suffering. But do you notice, do you see that word in verse 29? It has been granted to you. Not just to believe in him, but to suffer for him. You see, you haven't just been gifted with eternal life. You know what else you've been gifted with? Suffering. Suffering for Christ. In other words, we never want to be a church that measures how we're going by what makes us feel happy. We don't want to be a church that measures things by what makes us feel comfortable. No, we measure it by, is it living for Christ? Will this advance the gospel? If so, then, well, suffering will be involved. And it may not be the kind of suffering where you get thrown into the prison, but it will be costly. It will cost us time and effort and energy as we sit down with people, as we spend long hours building relationships with people. It could also cost us money. But the question is, will this advance the gospel? See, the gospel changes how we see ourselves. But here's the final implication. The gospel changes how we see Wentworthville. How do you see Wentworth Phil? You live in Wenty, you come to Wenty, you, you look around, and do you see things with gospel vision? Have you got your gospel vision eyes on? Because if you do, you'll look and see the opportunities that are before us. What opportunities do we have here in Wenty? What soldiers are we chained to, as it were? that we've got a captive audience, that we, can, we have an opportunity to share Christ with. Yet Paul sees people only in one of two ways, either they have Christ or they need Christ. Is that how you see people? What is it that we can do that will advance the gospel here? Because do you realise our church has opportunities here that no other church has by virtue of the fact that we're here and they're not. What are the unique opportunities to us that we have here in Wentworthville? You know, um, one of the last things that the Morrison government did uh, was that they signed a trade deal between Australia and India, which will see more Indians migrate to Australia. There will be more Indians coming here to work and also to study. And they'll come to suburbs like Wenty, where they already have connections with people um, as they settle in and as they orientate themselves. And guess what? They're coming in the second half of 2022. They're coming this year. Is our church ready for the influx from India? Are we ready for all the uni students that will come here and go off to Parramatta and Rydalmere and Sydney and UNSW to, to study? Are we ready for the young professionals that will come here to work? We'll get on the train at Wenty Station and go off into Parramatta or the city or Chatswood in order to work. Are we ready for the young families that will come here? Can playtime handle all the, all the kids that will be coming? Can our English classes cope with the grandparents who will be here and, and will want to learn some English? What about our knitting group? Is our church ready? Is, it, is our church itself ready? For the people that will come and visit, have we got the right welcoming structures set up? Are we ready for India to come to our doorstep? Friends, Indians are coming and they will leave the safety and security of their own country to come to this strange country. And they'll be lonely and they won't have any friends. And the question is, Will we take the time to build relationships with them? Will we share meals and offer our help? Will we look for opportunities to share Jesus? Here's a vision for us over the next five years. What if we as a church spent time 
building relationships with people in our community? What if we deliberately put on events that were relationship building events? You know, we, we're working on getting our hall refreshed. What if we use that as a centre where we could run events like what we're doing next Sunday night? What if that was like a model for us of things we could do in, in the future? where we could run events like trivia nights or games nights or Bollywood nights or movie nights or karate or social events um, in our hall so that we can all together join in contending for the gospel, building relationships with people in our community and look for opportunities to share Jesus. Are we ready for India? Are you ready to speak about Jesus with people? Are you ready yourself personally to be able to tell, you know, the tender stories of Jesus, how he sat with sinners, how he talked to people like Zacchaeus? Are you, are you ready to share the Jesus who said to that thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise? Can you share those stories? Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to share your story with people? Are you ready to sit down and open the Bible with people and read the Bible with someone who might like to sit down and read the Bible? Here's what Ben George, who's uh, an assistant minister at um, Auburn, said. Um, he's writing in the Gospel Coalition. He says, My experience has been that Indian friends have loved the opportunity to read the Bible and hear about Jesus. My experience is that Jesus, as he is revealed in Scripture, is irresistible for those thirsting after a genuine relationship with God. Are we ready? India has 1.4 billion people. Do you realise that India has one-third of the unreached people groups in the world? One-third of the people who have never even heard the name of Jesus live in India and India is coming to us what does that tell you isn't that a bit of a no-brainer what we should be doing as a church shouldn't we be telling people about Jesus who are coming to us wouldn't it be wonderful to see Indians come to Christ and be trained up and then sent back home to share others, to, sh to share Christ with others. Wouldn't that be a great vision for our church? Wouldn't it be great for us as a church, you know, over the next five years to, to take people down to Wenty Pool or Parramatta Lake and baptise people who came to Christ and train them up and send them back home to share Christ with others? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, it means that we'll take risks. It means that we'll do things that will reach our suburb. It means that we will build relationships with people. That's looking at our suburb with gospel vision. See, when you have the vision of the gospel, it shapes how you see yourself, it shapes how you see your church. Can I ask you, at the very least today, that you write down the name of three people who don't yet know Christ and you pray for them. You pray for them. Three people. We all know three people who don't yet know Christ, don't we? Let's pray for them. And in a church of 60 people, that's 180 people who are being prayed for. Isn't that wonderful? Because we want to see the gospel advance. So be like Paul, friends. Be like Paul. May his desire be our desire. May the advancement of the gospel be our single focus. You know, Paul says later on, you're not, if you're not convinced yet, Paul says later on in chapter 3, verse 17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Okay, Follow Paul in this. Um, and in chapter 4, verse 9, he says, whatever you've learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice. Be like Paul. You know, whatever you've seen in Paul this morning, do it. Have his focus as your focus. Have his mindset as your mindset. Will it advance the gospel? Will it advance the gospel? 
and let's do it together. Let's contend together for the sake of the gospel. Amen.